On our planet, there seems to be an infinite number of beautiful places one can visit with an equal number of spectacular things to admire. It requires nothing more than a curiosity to observe what is all around you. The miracle of nature manifests in countless ways, from breathtaking vistas to the simple movements of a common heifer. The purpose of this program is to present you with the extraordinary diversity of our miraculous blue planet so that you can discover these things for yourself. Today, we will enjoy visits to three different gems of the European continent. Starting off in the north, we will explore the pristine mountains of Lapland. From there, we will attempt to conquer the peaks of the Swiss Alps. From the Alps of Switzerland, we will go to France where, in the wine region known as Champagne, they know a thing or two about making the best wines in the world. Then, we will end today's adventure in Gibraltar, one of the pillars of the ancient world. But first, the unspoiled mountains of Lapland beckon. Welcome to Lapland and one of the most scarcely populated regions in Europe. Just over two million people live here on an area equivalent in size to Japan. Lapland isn't an independent state. Some of Lapland actually spreads over territory belonging to Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Russia. We enter Lapland via the largest town of northern Norway, Tromsø. It is from here that the famous Norwegian polar explorer, Raud Amundsen, set out on his expeditions. Today, the port of Tromsø is renowned mostly for its abundance of seafood. Salmon has about the same market value here as bread. The most recognizable creature spotted quite often in Lapland is the reindeer. Whether you believe in Santa or not, you ought to give way to reindeer on the roads. Wild reindeer weigh about 150 kilos. The locals will be sure to warn you to steer clear of them. Reindeer have short, thick coats that serve as the perfect protection against cold and dampness. Reindeer are capable of covering up to 160 kilometers a day and they are surprisingly great swimmers. In the northern part of Lapland, it is easy to get carried away by the sheer beauty of the Norwegian fjords. Here, the coast has been shaped into a bizarre system of bays and inlets. There is only one other place on the planet where this type of coast can be found, in South America, in the country of Chile, on the opposite side of the globe. Fjords are created in mountainous regions that are in close proximity to the sea. In order to develop, they require the continuous pressure of advancing glaciers combined with the deepening of river valleys. In these waters, fishermen will find both common salmon and the Atlantic salmon. Both species of salmon make the water of the fjords their home. Some of the fjords are tens of kilometers long. Most of Lapland lies beyond the Arctic Circle. Therefore, in the northernmost parts of Lapland, the sun never quite sets during the summer solstice and never rises above the horizon during the winter solstice. Should you feel that you are incapable of dealing with all your chores on a normal day, you should try this out. Your biorhythm is hugely different here. The polar summer, a time of the never-ending day, commences from the middle of May and goes through the end of August. During this period, the sun resembles a tennis ball flying over the net, never disappearing beyond the horizon. Instead, it just bounces right back. It is called the midnight sun. Those who consider Lapland to be the land of snow and ice are mistaken. Even here, nature happily offers pleasing views of spring meadows in bloom. In winter, the red signs serve as necessary orientation points for snowmobiles. In the summertime, however, the cable car is a more convenient mode of transport. Take this cable car up to Mount Nula. During the two kilometer ascent, the passengers admire breathtaking vistas of Nordic landscapes, uniquely devoid of human beings. Here, 
it takes a small miracle to encounter another human being. Thousands of tourists from around the world flock to myriad nature reservations in Lapland, clamoring only to admire its unspoiled beauty. They leave with memories of immense lakes, countless rivers and brooks, dense forests, beautiful mountains, and deep valleys. Many believe that experiencing the magic of the local nature is akin to an intense cleansing experience, normally associated only with a health or relaxation spa. We will conclude our trek through the vastness of Lapland by visiting the Finnish village of Nelim. Nelim lies on the shores of the largest lake in Lapland, Lake Inari. Its northern shores are referred to as the real Lapland. If you are lucky, you may encounter a genuine Sami. Unfortunately, there are only 70,000 members of this culture remaining in the whole of Lapland. At this time of year, the lengthy day is nowhere near its end just yet. However, we are running out of time. So let's bid farewell to the land of the midnight sun and head south to a warmer climate. Switzerland welcomes you with the heartfelt tunes of its national instrument, the Alpine horn. The horn is almost as evocative of Switzerland as chocolate, watches, and cheese. It is inherently linked to the local landscape, made up of mountains and mist. This confederation of 26 cantons in the very center of Europe can boast of having Europe's highest mountain, the highest concentration of financiers in the world, and Swiss precision. Switzerland is just as well known for its charming miniature models. 27 miniatures made to the scale of 1 to 25 can be viewed here. The miniatures are exact replicas of Swiss fortresses, cable cars, and railways. The legend has it that these miniatures are the works of elves and goblins. The truth is that the Swiss have all of these models manufactured in France. To truly enjoy some of Switzerland's splendor, it may be necessary to overcome 4,000 meter peaks, an ordeal that may take up the better part of an hour, with a little help from some machinery, of course. Reaching the peaks takes a cogway. The cogway is a very special lift that uses cogs. The one seen here happens to be the steepest one in the world. It overcomes inclines of up to 48 degrees and has been in operation since the end of the 19th century. Sweeping views signify the end of the peaceful journey through the rock massifs. From the summit of Pilat, the mountain towering above Luzerne and what is believed to be the final resting place of Pontius Pilate, we can see almost all of Switzerland. That is, if the valleys aren't veiled in fog or mist. The residents of Luzerne have an explanation for this haze. Legends say that because dragons have become fond of the mountain, they linger in the area, unleashing fiery vapors and causing the fog and mists to become dense. When it comes to ecology, the Swiss are a lot more advanced than their neighbors. The mass usage of trains alone is a significant indicator of their close relationship to nature. A typical example of Swiss ecological thinking is the creation of the Auto Verladung, trains that transport cars through tunnels. And because you're in Switzerland, you could easily set your watch by the precision of the train's schedule. From Kleine Scheidegg, we can use the Cogway to reach the highest situated European railway station. It terminates at the respectable altitude of 3,500 meters above sea level and hides in the Jungfrau Joch Gap. This cogway overcomes a super elevation of 1,400 meters up to four times a day. The returning journeys are the quietest ones. The passengers are dazed by the low oxygen content in the air and, as a result, often fall asleep. There is a network of tunnels for the pedestrians leading from the terminal station to the summit. Most of these are carved in ice. It is hardly surprising 
given that the highest concentration of glaciers in continental Europe is right here in the Swiss Alps. The mountain Jungfrau, meaning virgin, neighbors with mountains called hunter and monk. The question arises then, how come she is still a virgin when a hunter is nearby? The logical answer is, because a monk stands between them. The ice cave, also called the palace in Jungfrau, lies deep beneath masses of ice. It is a world of utter silence and repose and is the perfect venue for the exhibition of ice sculptures. The glacier moves a little each year, and so the cave has to be repaired continuously so as to prevent it from caving in. Unfortunately, the greatest threat to the caves are the visitors. More specifically, their body heat and breath create a thermal problem. The Greenland Husky is a happy resident of the mountain slopes. Its initial purpose was to deliver provisions and mail to the summits. These dogs are still here. Halfway up the mountain, at about 2,300 meters above sea level, is a breeding station that was established over 70 years ago. The resident pack of dogs are the best in the world. These dogs have a very discernible and prized lineage. Their direct ancestors were the first to conquer the North Pole. The Great Aletsch Glacier in the Bernese Alps is the longest glacier in the Alps. Its course of 24 kilometers ends in the very south of Switzerland. Its area has been diminishing dramatically over the last 20 years. The Bernese Alps are the largest and the most significant mountain range in Switzerland and throughout the European continent. The mountain range is distinguished by its significant degree of glaciation. It is time to head off to the Wallace region, which lines 40 peaks exceeding 4,000 meters. The fantastic pists are as much a lure as Swiss cheese. The Swiss are true masters in this domain. They rotate the manufacture of three types of cheese here, Brignon for raclette, the smaller semi-soft Tomé, and the soft Ciroc. Raclette is one of the Swiss cheese specialties. It is melted cheese served with hot, unpeeled potato chips. Wallace is the largest wine canton in Switzerland due to its spread over 5,000 hectares. Today, over 50 different kinds of wine are cultivated here. The snow caps took the wine growers by surprise. The grapes are peeking from beneath their white cover and many a wine grower looks forward to ice wine. The sight of vineyards, though, serves as a reminder that our time in Switzerland is up and that it is high time to head off to one of Europe's loveliest regions. We are off to explore the region that gave its name to the most famous wine in the world. Vineyards in autumn hues, a view out of this world. It is just the way many of us imagine the legendary wine region of Champagne. Nothing but wine bushes stretching in between horizons. In reality, wine can only be cultivated in a few selected areas. This elite selection makes up just under 2% of the Champagne Ardennes area. It was the ancient Romans that first planted wine here in the 5th century. They felt that the area bore a strong resemblance to the Italian Campania. That created the origin of the region's name. The Champagne wine growers were faced with a long and tiring battle against the prevailing natural conditions before Champagne as we know it today became the world's favorite liquid with which to toast special occasions. Champagne originated most likely by accident. It was a natural process. After primary fermentation and bottling, a second alcoholic fermentation occurs in the bottle. Nowadays, a single method called the Method Champenois is used. The grape juice, extracted using only the pressure by hand, is allowed to become regular wine first. The bubbles occur in the next phase. Carbon dioxide is released from the casks into the surrounding air during fermentation. The wine is subsequently bottled with sugar added to ensure the secondary fermentation. 
That corked bottle is then laid to rest in a wine cellar for several months. There are some 450 villages in Champagne where champagne is made and each one has a slightly different taste. This is Lac du Der. With a surface area of 48 square kilometers, it is Europe's largest man-made lake. Its weirs, or barriers, protect Paris from floods, and the water from the River Seine is controlled from here. Even though this isn't a natural lake, fauna abounds here. The conservationists are aware of its importance to bird migration. The migrating birds either winter over or nest here. When these elegant birds cluster together, it is a sight worth seeing and something that cannot be missed by passionate ornithologists. The only ones not all that enthusiastic about the birds are local farmers. The cranes attack surrounding fields each morning to feed on bulbs, roots, and other sources of digestible energy. Thankfully, the birds are protected, and so the farmers can only helplessly observe. And so nature lovers may take pleasure in watching squadrons of migrating birds each fall. The tranquility, the comparatively cheap lifestyle, the good wine, and the pretty country girls are what likely attracted many artists to the region. The painter, Pierre-Auguste Renoir, was doubtlessly the best known among them. Unique colors and quality of light kept him busy. A job well done was rewarded by another local delicacy, one that grows underground. The dogs are trained for a very specific task, finding truffles. Sociable breeds, such as Labradors and Shepherds, are commonly used for this purpose. Hunting dogs are not suitable. Despite the high value of truffles, the making of champagne is still the primary business activity of this region. The market value of champagne truffles is currently about $500 per kilo. The window of opportunity to collect truffles is rather short, only the few weeks from the end of September to the beginning of December. It is important that the ground is not frozen more than two to three centimeters under the surface, or else the planters may bid their bounty goodbye. We can only envy their autumn dog walking strolls through breathtaking nature in search of one of the world's most sought after gastronomic treasures. One of the largest towns of the region is Reims. It bears a rich history and, as such, is a favorite tourist attraction. The knight you see here is actually Joan of Arc. It was as a result of her visions and her determination that Charles VII was declared the King of France in 1429. This was the time when all of Europe was fixated by the Reims Cathedral. The building of the Notre Dame Cathedral, dedicated to the Virgin Mary, began in the 8th century on the foundations of another cathedral built 400 years earlier. It was here that most French kings were crowned. 38 heads of state in all lived to see their anointment here. The tradition was initialized by the French king Clovis I, the first king of the Franks to unite all the Frankish tribes under one ruler. He was baptized right here towards the end of the 5th century by Saint Remigius, for the next thousand years, his successors traveled to Reims to be anointed by the coronation oil from the Sant Ampule. Through this act, they became knights and so could fulfill the motto of their calling, to rule is to serve. It is quite remarkable that this motto is still followed today. Historical events are what will be at the center of today's final destination. Gibraltar welcomes you. It is the southernmost cape of Europe, almost touching Africa. A cradle of history, Gibraltar is a strategic strait and an important shipping crossroad. It is also the only British overseas territory on the old continent. And even if it may seem irrelevant, it is also the only part of Europe where monkeys live naturally. We crossed the Spanish border in a village quite significantly called Linie, and out of nowhere we materialized in the United Kingdom. 
Spain was forced to concede Gibraltar to Britain in 1713 under the Treaty of Utrecht, which concluded the war. The Spanish never quite accepted this, but in a referendum in 1967 and again in 2002, the Gibraltarians voted overwhelmingly to remain under British sovereignty. During the last attempt of Spain to retake Gibraltar in the years 1779 to 1783, the British dug out a 113 meter long tunnel into the rock while under siege. This tunnel enabled them to bombard the Spanish from atop the mountain. What we are seeing here is a cloud that is inseparably linked to the rock of Gibraltar. The cloud is known as Levanta. When the wind blows from the east, the cloud is trapped on the rock peak and forms one of the most recognized symbols of Gibraltar. The rock of Gibraltar is used as a resting place by great numbers of migrating birds en route from Africa. There are about 270 different kinds of birds found here. There is no source of water on the rock. Even so, it is covered in vegetation. Over 600 different plants, ferns, and lichens grow here, six of which grow nowhere else in Europe. Nature tackled the lack of water on the rock with admirable ease. The plants actually desalinate seawater. That is one of the reasons the rock of Gibraltar is considered a very unique formation, not only from the geopolitical point of view, but also from the biological perspective. These members of the animal kingdom are no less unique, as this happens to be the one and only colony of monkeys living freely on the European continent. These monkeys are Barbary macaques. No one knows exactly how they got to Gibraltar, but there are countless theories on the matter. Locals think highly of the monkeys despite their shameless cheekiness with which they rob tourists of their snacks. There is a saying that as long as the monkeys remain, Gibraltar will stay British. There's gotta be something to this. During World War II, none other than Winston Churchill himself ordered that the dwindling numbers of monkeys in Gibraltar be replenished. Today, the monkeys are safeguarded by the Helping Hand organization. Because the macaques are extremely tame, they face a difficult problem. People spoil the monkeys with various treats, which are often harmful to them. The organization's director would prefer that all human contact with the monkeys were banned. However, such a ban could easily eliminate one of the major attractions bringing tourists to Gibraltar. Let us now retreat into the interior of the St. Michael's Cave. It is an extensive stalactical labyrinth. People believed that the cave was bottomless. A legend exists about an underwater tunnel leading all the way to Africa. The legend is not based on fact. However, an unexplained mystery prevails. Sometime around the year 1840, a Lieutenant Mitchell, along with another officer, were seen luring themselves into the cave, never to come out. A hundred years later, a thorough forensic investigation found no human remains. This British piper of Nepalese origin will see us off on today's final stop. It is the southernmost point of Gibraltar, referred to by the locals as Europa Point. Its name signifies the fact that this is where Europe ends. Gibraltar has always been a very strategic place. The Strait of Gibraltar separates the Atlantic Ocean from the Mediterranean Sea. To the north lies Spain and Gibraltar. To the south lies Morocco and the Spanish town of Ceuta. The lighthouse truly may claim to be one at the very end of the world. And it is the lighthouse that bids us farewell. Our journey to the miraculous nooks of our planet comes to an end for now. On the next exploration of our compelling and bountiful planet Earth, we will travel to the very north of Great Britain the Shetland Islands. Here, a million birds watch as the human population, numbering only 20,000, gets on with their everyday lives. We will then travel from the very end of the world to its very center, 
The local nomadic dervishes called the Pshibalchashi region in the southeastern province of Kazakhstan, Almaty, the center of the world. Later, we will follow our camera to the Yellow Mountains in central China and the Cheng Kang, known as the Venice of China. That's all right here on Miracles of Nature. We hope you'll join us. planet, there seems to be an infinite number of beautiful places one can visit, with an equal number of spectacular things to admire. It requires nothing more than a curiosity to observe what is all around you. The miracle of nature manifests in countless ways, from breathtaking vistas to the simple movements of a common heifer. The purpose of this program is to present you with the extraordinary diversity of our miraculous blue planet so that you can discover these things for yourself. Today, we will travel to the very north of Great Britain, the Shetland Islands. Here, a million birds watch as the human population, numbering only 20,000, gets on with their everyday lives. The cooler climate accounts for the purposeful character of the locals. We will then travel from the very end of the world to its very center. The local nomadic dervishes called the Pshibalchashi region in the southeastern province of Kazakhstan, Almaty, the center of the world. Later, we will follow our camera to the Yellow Mountains in central China and the Cheng Kang, known as the Venice of China. Our last stop will bring us back to the center of Europe. We will visit a region of the Czech Republic known as Bohemian Paradise. Here we will explore rocky labyrinths and ancient castles. We will also discover the semi-precious stone called Czech Garnets. Up until 1970, this area was known as Zetland. Today, we know it as the Shetland Islands, the northernmost province of Great Britain. It is under Scottish administration. These islands are spoken about in the history of the Romans, Vikings, and of course the Anglo-Saxons. The islands also played an important role during the Second World War when they were used, among other things, as a transition for Allied spies. Only 16 out of the hundreds of islands in this group are inhabited. The largest island has the simple name, Mainland. The fauna is not quite as poor as we might have expected from a location on the 60th parallel. The warm gulf current affects the temperature of the sea. The result is a sea temperature that never falls below 5 degrees Celsius. Puffins are the most distinctive inhabitants of the seaside cliffs. Despite their size and apparent helplessness, the puffins deal impressively with the sharp winds and uncomfortable rocky nests, which they often swap for burrows in the gravel coastline. The cliffs are washed by the waters of the Pacific Ocean and the North Sea. For geographers, the Shetland Islands represent an ocean dividing line. No point inland is further than five kilometers from the coast. The highest point is Ronas Hill, rising 450 meters above sea level. Indulging in seal watching is a pleasant way to pass the time while waiting to spot the mysterious high fin sperm whale. Though no one has ever seen this whale for sure, it's universally believed to regularly visit the bays around the Shetland Islands. The islands are an important bird-watching venue. Because a million birds live on the islands, it was natural that bird-watching would become so popular. The traditional industries of farming and rearing sheep do not profit from bird-watching. The vast pastures are no problem for the sheep whose wool is so thick, 
they can easily survive even the coldest winters. Each owner of a flock must train their sheepdog with fast commands and whistling. A well-trained dog that obeys its master's commands without hesitation is the pride of every farmer. The Shetland sheep are indigenous to the islands. They are related to the extinct Scottish Dunface. They are characterized by a smaller overall size and wool of high quality. This flock, and many others, will have their wool collected to be used in knitting the famous and very warm Shetland sweaters and quilts. Historically, wool has been one of the most important trading articles for the islands. Because of its quality, it quickly gained an excellent international reputation. At first, the wool fell is sorted according to quality and type. The roughest wool is destined for carpet making and the best for the making of sweaters. Wool that appears to be as wispy as a cobweb is considered to be the most valuable. The wool is usually dyed for export purposes. However, the traditional local products are usually made from natural wool. The skillful hands of these seamstresses create first-class tweed suits, scarves, sweaters, and quilts. Knitting has even been elevated to a course offered in the local university. At first sight, the isolated landscape seems to be scarred by remnants of walls. Are they from an archaeological site? Actually, this is where another local industry is in full swing, peat extraction. Peat is a byproduct of plants. It is considered a valuable fertilizer and is also used to make high quality biological filters. Once dried, all that remains are bits of plant root. Peat is used on the islands as fuel as wood is in extremely short supply. During the Bronze and Iron Ages, people believed that the might of the gods of nature was hidden in peat. Even the first Shetland settlers, the Vikings, used peat as fuel. First, it is necessary to remove the top layer of the earth. Then, this particular spade is used to cut out little peat bricks, briquettes. The very best peat is found the deeper you can dig. The annual permit for the extraction of peat works out to about $30. Though entities that extract the peat have a significant labor cost, the cost of the actual energy is considered quite cheap. Peat briquettes burn easily and produce a lot less smoke than does wood. But the Nature Protection Societies warn that peat extraction, especially the industrial type, destroys the natural habitat of many plants and animals. This, in turn, contributes to the extinction of some plant and animal species because it takes the peat bogs several hundred years to rebuild. Peat bogs make up 2% of the Earth's surface and cover about 3 million square kilometers. This pony, the Shetland pony, is as special in its own way as the Shetland sheep. The Viking invaders brought the ponies to the islands. Over centuries, the cold, harsh climate caused the breed to evolve, gradually becoming extremely hardy. Countless generations have used this stubborn by nature pony as a primary means of transport. It is said that the ponies require tough and uncompromising handling. The ponies grow to about a meter at the shoulders. The question of their future breeding is a source of dispute and differing opinion. While some wish to breed a small as possible super pony, others claim that the pony must be, above all else, useful. Regardless of what fate has in store for the Shetland pony, one thing is for sure. The pony symbolizes the development of the Shetland society, from tough and stubborn Vikings to the smiling, caring, and hardworking men and women of today. Footpath to the beach, and in the opposite direction, simply footpath. These simple signs enable one to quickly become oriented to the islands. The islands are so small that it is next to impossible to get lost. Let us harness the wind blowing above the sea, and let it bring us all the way to Kazakhstan.
The first human traces in Kazakhstan are documented back to 2000 years BCE. In the second millennium AD, descendants of the nomadic herdsmen lived in huge cities and only visited the homes of their ancestors living in the wilderness and steppes for holidays. Kazakhstan was a territory at the epicenter of the Great Game, the Anglo-Russian conflict over Central Asia. During the communist era, the Russians established their power through the building of important infrastructure in the area. In 1991, Kazakhstan, together with the former Soviet satellites, gained independence. Traversing the country of Kazakhstan would require several months because its surface area is equivalent to that of the entire continent of Europe. Let us visit the region in the southeast, a place known as Przybalchashi, meaning seven rivers. Seven rivers originate here and flow to either the Aral Sea or the Balkash Lake. The most important of these rivers is called the Charon River. It is a significant source of water and contains breathtaking scenery which was created in the rocks surrounding it over the centuries. Only 200 kilometers from the capital Almaty lies the Charon Pass, visited by people from around the globe. Russian rafters discovered the pass only 40 years ago. They called it Dolina Zamkov, which is Russian for the Valley of Castles. The rock formations all around them seem to resemble the dwellings of mountain giants, or with just a little imagination, the surface of an unknown planet. At first sight, it's hard to believe that the Charon, which appears now as an innocent stream, could be the culprit responsible for the creation of such magnificent formations. But unlike its flow in the summer, during the springtime glacier thaw, the Charon becomes an energy-charged white water monster. Rugged nature has a tendency to cause people to fabricate myths about it. Similarly, the Soviet occupation left a number of urban legends in its wake. The archaeologists discovered the statue of the Golden Man in 1969, but local legend has a different version of its discovery. The story goes that a drunken tractor driver fell out of his machine and knocked his head on something hard. Another story claims that it was discovered by a man wishing to turn this mound into a garage. In any case, this happens to be the armor of a sake king, the symbol of modern Kazakhstan. Sometime in the spring, between April and May, the steppe awakens from its winter slumber. This is the time when one marvels at the blooming flowers. The Kazakh steppe is the home to wild tulips, which in places form yellow or yellow-orange carpets. Forget the Dutch hybrids. This is the real thing. Falconry is a traditional means of making a living. Lately, this skill is making way for the more profitable opportunities in agriculture or office jobs in the big cities. The falconers were always honored members of society, and the skill of commanding birds was passed down from generation to generation. A group of enthusiasts from the Nora village is attempting to keep the skill contemporary, or at least maintain its importance for the Kazakh culture. Together, they established a center housing the Museum of Falconry, which contains items closely knit to falconry. They also offer falconry training for those interested. Above anything, the Pshibalchashi fills the dry steppes. At the dawn of the 20th century, the steppes provided the nomadic dervishes with something they were seeking for a long, long time. Tranquility, peace, natural beauty, and a mystical place. According to the dervishes, the center of the world lies right here. It is deemed to be a place where the energy from the cosmos meets the energy of the earth. The dervishes occupied themselves with science and meditation. With the aid of these combined energies, they could cure various diseases. 
anyone, regardless of their religion or social standing, could come here for healing. This rock radiates heat while the surrounding ground is cold. And so, for instance, should you suffer from rheumatism, you should stand atop the rock and allow its energy to pass through your body. Shibal Chashi hides a number of secrets. It also invites musing and meditation. The sweeping yet tranquil steps beckon to be explored on horseback. Sadly, we have to move on to central China. Welcome to central China, or as the locals call it, the empire of the center. As a result of thousands of years of tradition, the Chinese perceived their immense country to be the true navel on the body of the world. Miss Gao prepares a cup of tea, but not in a way we are accustomed to. She uses a tea bag and boiling water from a tea can. The traditional tea drinking ceremony is actually an ancient ritual. It requires years of painstaking practice. The whole process has to be carried out as diligently, magically, and nobly as possible. It must be accomplished with perfection. The complex ritual is accompanied by music from the sacred Kucheng. In China, music and art were often inspired by the Yellow Mountains or Huangshan. In the 17th century, the scholar and traveler Zhu Jiake wrote about the breathtaking scenery of a mountain ridge overgrown by pine trees in the following words. When a man once discovers Huangshan, he loses the desire to conquer other peaks as he comes to the realization that his journey has come to an end. These peaks enjoy poetic names, the lion's summit or the monkey looking out to the sea. They evoke the world of ancient legends. One better known legend is about the unfortunate lovers, Tai Ching and Mao Chiken, who decided to end their suffering by jumping into the ocean of clouds. The old Zen masters perceived the age-long game of the clouds and the mountain peaks as a battle, and at the same time as the harmony of the opposites, the principles of yin and yang. The temples high up in the mountains are not easily accessible. Therefore, a number of tourists prefer to be carried up there on a sedan chair. The porters claim that they save the lives of many. Several hundred kilometers from the Yellow Mountains lie another natural gem of China, a bamboo forest, the motif of many a Chinese painting. The course of the water from the waterfall is diverted from the mountain range of the Yellow Mountains. Aerialists, able to bend their bodies into all sorts of odd shapes or overcome their own survival instincts by cycling on a rope high in the air, are very popular in China. Miss Gao is almost done with the tea ceremony and pours the first cup of fragrant Chinese tea. Let's have a taste of this delicious hot brew. We may need it as a trip to the cold waters of the unique town of Cheng Kang lies in store for us. The modern buildings of Cheng Kang have nothing more to offer than traditional life similar to that in any other small Chinese town. Its historical center is much more appealing. Cheng Kang was established in the time of the Song Dynasty, more than a thousand years ago, and is now on the UNESCO National Heritage Site List. 
One could say that Chiang Kang is the Chinese equivalent of Venice. The life rhythm is adapted to the water which bathes the foundations of each and every house. Movement on the lake is uncomplicated, using a simple boat or a ferry, and it is ecological. Central Asia is truly a place of huge contrasts. But how is Central Europe doing? Let's find out. Right in the very center of Europe lies the Czech Republic. And in the very center of the Czech Republic lies a region known as the Bohemian Paradise. Millions of years ago, volcanoes and oceans raged here. At that time, they created alternating peaceful and dramatic vistas. Today, people living in this area live harmonious lives. They preoccupy themselves with agriculture and basically mind their own business. The communist repression affected a number of the agricultural estates in the Bohemian paradise. The bees, however, seem oblivious to this fact. Just as did their predecessors, they collect nectar in the surrounding forests and from picturesque meadows, making honey that is praised for its purity of taste. Many of the villages maintain an air of traditional countryside life. These unchanged wooden cottages are a testimony to that. Many castles and palaces are maintained in perfect condition, even though they no longer are occupied by their original aristocratic owners. The Trotsky Castle is of particular interest. It was built on two volcanic craters in the 14th century by Chenyek from Wartenberg. The Prachowski Mountains are made of sandstone. It is what made them an ideal building material for entire generations of local inhabitants. But they did not quarry the sandstone and take it to an off-site building location. They actually carved the dwellings directly into the rock. The last dwelling was made by a local farmer sometime during the second half of the 12th century. The varied and deciduous forest hides peculiar rock formations. Up close, it is surprising how high these are. The region, therefore, is a favorite location among mountain climbers and tourists who come here to either test their strength or simply to relax in the shade of the rocky labyrinth. Many of the peaks are only accessible using the man-made passages or ladder systems. The way up can often be quite dramatic, but it is rewarded with stunning views over the imposing surrounding landscape of the Bohemian Paradise. It was on peaks such as these that robber barons built their abodes. The area also served as the hiding place to people being religiously persecuted by the Czech Kingdom. Each peak has its own character and is named accordingly. Loner, the mace, crooked tower, wreck, dry love, the Bohemian Paradise is more than just the land of towering sandstones, stunning panoramas, and historical castles. It is also the place where the Czech garnets, the world-renowned semi-precious stones, originate. Garnet is the age-old symbol of the Czech Kingdom. The stones are said to be petrified droplets of the blood of the gods. The ancient healers considered the garnets to be a universally fortunate stone meant as a source of life's energy and courage, as well as a source of joy to its lucky owner. These semi-precious stones are turned into stunning jewelry in the town of Turnov.
A sun, colored like the Czech garnets, sets above the castle of Trotsky. And with it, we say our goodbyes. Our journey to the miraculous nooks of our planet comes to an end, for now. On the next exploration of our compelling and bountiful planet Earth, we will travel to the region of southern Moravia. Did you really think that orchids only thrive in the tropics? Far from it. These phenomenal and exquisite plants also flourish in the very heart of Europe. Later, we will go back to the Caribbean, to Cuba. Cuba is a place of unbelievable natural beauty and of brutal cockfighting. Then, finally, we will visit Fiji in the Pacific Ocean. Its enchanting nature is often untouched by humans, and so it is perceived as a true paradise on Earth. That's all right here on Miracles of Nature. We hope you'll join us.